Hi class, uh, welcome to your first lecture for Math 117, um, College Quantitative Reasoning. In this lecture here today, what I want to talk about is I want to talk about two different types of reasoning methods, one called inductive and the other called deductive. So this is about inductive and deductive reasoning. All right, so our objectives with this lecture here is just twofold. We want to understand and use what we call inductive reasoning. We want to understand and use deductive reasoning. Okay. Let's talk about inductive reasoning first. So this is the process of arriving at a general conclusion based on observations of very specific examples. Okay, so there's some definitions here. The first is a, what we call a conjecture hypothesis. So this is uh, the conclusion formed as a result of inductive reasoning, which may or may not be true. So inductive reasoning, again, is arriving at a general conclusion based on some observations of very specific examples. Okay, so like here's a conjecture hypothesis. Um, say the last two days, uh, each two days I've gotten up at 8 a.m. So my conclusion by inductive reasoning is basically since Matt's gotten up at 8 a.m. the last two days, Matt must get up at uh, 8 a.m. every day. But like you can kind of see the fault with that. So we can talk about what's called a counterexample. This is a case for which the conjecture here is not true, which proves this, the conjecture false. Like, so the last two days I got up at 8 a.m., but three days ago I got up at like 9 a.m., so that's a counterexample that proves this false. So inductive reasoning is just based on a few specific examples. All right, I wanna talk about the difference between strong and weak inductive arguments. So here's a strong inductive argument. So in a random sample of 380,000, that's a lot, freshmen at 772 different four-year colleges, 25% they frequently come to class without completing readings or assignments, which is bad. So what we can conclude then that there is a 95% probability that between 24.84 and 25.25 of all college freshmen frequently come to class unprepared. Okay, this technique is what we call random sampling. This is going to be discussed later on in the course. And uh, the thing with random sampling is each member of the group has an equal chance of being chosen. So we can make predictions like we just did here, right, based on a random sample taken from an entire population. So we, we of all the college freshmen, there, because there's more than 380,000, okay, we randomly sampled from all the college freshmen, 380,000 of them, and found that this basically 25% of students come to class unprepared. We sampled a large pot, a large number of, of um, students, and, and because we sampled from a large number here and it was randomly done, we can say this is a strong inductive argument. It was a weak inductive argument. You can see the difference. So maybe your conjecture hypothesis is that men have dif difficulty expressing their feelings. Or you could say something like, neither my dad nor my boyfriend ever cried in front of me. Okay, so therefore, men must have um, difficulty expressing feelings. Well, this conclusion is based on just two observations, and this sample is neither random nor large enough to represent all men. You know, for example, when, when I got married a few years ago, I, I basically cried the entire day. Okay, so that, that's a counter argument that just um, disproves this conjecture hypothesis. And just so we're clear, I cried because I was so happy. All right, strong, randomly done, large sample, weak. Um, Small sample and the and the sample you collect is not random it's because you know these two people. It's actually what's called a convenient sample. It's just the, the two, two men right there in front of you in your life. All right, so I want to do an, an inductive reasoning now example with numbers. Okay, so I want to identify a pattern in each list of numbers. So I've got a couple of different examples here. Then I want to use this pattern to find the next number. So I've got these numbers. 3, 12, 21, 30, 39, and then what's the next number? Okay, so 3, then to 12, then 21, then 30, then 39. Hmm, what must be next? All right, so since the numbers are increasing relatively slowly here, what you'll want to do is you might want to try addition, okay, just to see what, what's going on here. So if you look here, the common difference between each pair of numbers is 9. So to get from 3 to 12, you have to add 9. 12 to 21, you have to add 9, and so on. So you can see that even along these few examples, all you're doing is adding 9 to the previous number. 
So then what must be the next number? Well, therefore, the next number is you take 39, you add 9, and you get 48. Okay, so the way I did this or saw this was since the numbers are increasing relatively slowly, relatively slowly. I mean, what about this? 3 to 12 to 48 to 192 to 768, my gosh. All right, well, since the numbers are increasing relatively quickly here, uh, you might want to try multiplication. So as I see, to get from 3 to 12, I have to multiply it by 4. But when I multiply 12 by 4, oh, wow, I get 48. Then when I multiply 48 by 4, boom, I get 192. When I multiply 192 by 4, boom, I get 768. So therefore, the common ratio between each pair of numbers is 4. So thus, the next number, I have to take this 768, multiply it by 4. And the next number will be 3072, 3072. All right, let's try this one. This one's a little weird. What comes next in this list of numbers? 1, then 1, then 2, then 3, then 5, then, oh, this is weird, then 8, then 13, then 21. Yikes. So it, it spends some time thinking about this. But actually, when you, if, if you, Look it over. The pattern here is formed by adding the previous two numbers to get the next number. Like, for example, 1 plus nothing here is 1. Then 1 plus 1 gets me 2. Then 2 plus 1 gets me 3. Then 3 plus 2 gets me 5. 5 plus 3 gets me 8. And you can see the pattern. 8 plus 5 gets me 13. 13 plus 8 gets me 21. All right, so then the next number, I got to take 21 and add it to 13, so 13 plus 21, next number is 34. All right, so inductive reasoning, you have to be careful because there can actually be more than one answer or one solution. So if you look at this picture here, all right, just kind of like a visual of it, is this illusion a wine goblet? Like this white part here is a wine goblet, something you might want to drink wine or something else out of, or is it two faces? Like is this silhouette here one face? And is this silhouette another face? You know, there's two solutions. It could be both. Looking here, if I have the sequence 2, 4, right, what is the next number in the sequence? Right? If the pattern is to add 2, 2 plus 4 would get me 6. But if the pattern is to, is to multiply um, the previous number by 2, then the answer is 8. Because 2 times 4, or 2 times 2 gets me 4, 4 times 2 would give me 8. So the thing here is we need to know one more number to decide on this. Uh, let's try this one, uh, finding the next figure in a visual pattern. Okay, so I want to describe actually the two patterns in the sequence of figures. And then I want to use the pattern to draw the next figure. So just generally, look what's going on here. Circle, square, circle, square. So what should this be? Well, circle, square, circle, square, circle. And then look here. You're getting an X drawn through each shape, and it looks like that the dots, the one dot, two dot, three dots, is getting rotated counterclockwise into the next area each time. Like in the next one gets rotated down to here. Then this one gets rotated down into here. So obviously it should be a circle, and this should get rotated into this quadrant here just by looking at it. So the first pattern concerns the shapes. Obviously we can predict that it's a circle, like I said. The second pattern concerns the dots within the circle. So we can predict that the dots will follow the pattern from the zero to three dots, right, in the section, rotating them, as I said, counterclockwise. So that figure below, ha, ah, looks exactly like how I described it. Okay, now let's talk about deductive reasoning, a little bit stronger argument. Deductive reasoning is the process of proving a specific conclusion from one or more general statements. So a conclusion that is proved to be true by deductive reasoning is what we call a theorem. So let me give an example of deductive reasoning, all right? So an everyday situation and then the deductive reasoning. All right, one player, so you got two people in Scrabble playing. So one player says to another player in Scrabble, you have to remove those five letters you put down. You can't use Texas as a word. All right, so the general statement is all proper names are prohibited in Scrabble and Texas is a proper noun, proper name. Okay, so Texas is a proper name. So the conclusion therefore is, is that Texas is prohibited in Scrabble, right? So you're just 
you're taking you're taking this everyday situation and, and putting it into a general conclusion. Texas is prohibited travel, and, and Texas is prohibited in Scrabble because of these two reasons. Proper names are prohibited in Scrabble, and Texas is a proper name. All right, so I'm um, using inductive reasons applied to these rules and then ask if we see a pattern, and then we'll talk about deductive reasons. Okay, so select a number. Okay, so I'm going to do an example with the numbers 4, 7, and 11. Multiply the number by 6. Well, when you multiply these numbers by 6, you get 24, 42, 66. Add 8 to what you just got. Well, then you get 32, 50, 74. Divide this sum by 2. Well, this becomes 16, this becomes 50, this becomes 37, and then subtract it by 4. So it becomes 12, becomes 21, becomes 33. Okay, but we did all these um, steps. So by inductive reasoning, okay, what, what, what do you think the final result is? Well, to go from 4 to and to get to 12, you multiply by 3. To go from 7 to 21, well, you multiply, wow, by 3. And to go from 11 to 33, wow, again, you multiply by 3. So by inductive reasoning, the pattern is just take a number and multiply it by 3. That's by inductive reasoning, just using these three examples. All right, but now that was inductive reasoning. Now using deductive reasoning, okay, to prove a general case. All right, we use n to represent the number. So I'm going to select the number n. I'm going to multiply this number by 6. So 6n means 6 times n. Then I'm going to add 8 to it. Well, that just becomes uh, 6n plus 8. I'm going to divide this by 2. Well, 6n plus 8 divided by 2, breaking this fraction apart, just becomes 3n plus 4. And then subtract 4, 3n plus 4 minus 4. Ha! You just get 3n, which is just 3 times the number you selected. So this with deductive reasoning showing a general case, does this agree with our inductive hypothesis? Absolutely, absolutely. So just to conclude, inductive reasoning, you form a conclusion off a small number of observations. Like in this case, we formed a conclusion off just three observations. Deductive reasoning, you, you show that the general case can be true, or you, or you prove, uh, or you make a conclusion off some previously known statements, like that Texas and Scrabble one. All right, thanks class, that was your first lecture.